Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to this seminar on Baltic Sea security. Um, my name is Mikkel Rongen Olsen and I'm a senior researcher here at Dietz. Um, I primarily work on Baltic Sea region security, uh, the Nordic region, Danish foreign policy and transatlantic relations. And I'll uh, start out uh, this morning uh, by uh, introducing uh, the panel and the panelists. Um, after the Cold War, uh, the Baltic Sea region as such uh, brief, uh, briefly went away from, uh, from uh, uh, the big security politics picture. Uh, for about 25 years following the end of the Cold War, uh, talks about security in harder terms were almost uh, non-existent. And this was, of course, due to the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and um, a new era of, uh, of uh, uh, much more corroborative relations between Russia and the West. Uh, now, this uh, state of affairs has changed gradually, but if one has to point to one year in particular, uh, it would be 2014 and the Ukraine crisis, uh, which led to, among other things, the breakdown in the uh, relationship between Russia and the West. And this has impacted uh, more or less uh, every region in the world, but uh, the Baltic Sea region uh, has certainly been, uh, been uh, quite affected by this. Since then, much has happened in the region. Uh, NATO's enhanced force presence has reinforced the Baltic countries and Poland, uh, and uh, discussions about uh, Russia's foreign and security uh, policy in the regions uh, have been intense, uh, and has also actually included Russia's energy policy and questions about uh, how Russia has been able to use uh, especially gas as a tool in foreign and security policy. Uh, and this is the topics that we are going to talk about uh, today. Uh, and uh, of course, in the midst of all of this, the, the question arises also, what can small countries in the Baltic Sea region do to try to, to help each other uh, navigate a, a Baltic Sea region uh, that is changing, that is characterized uh, more by tension uh, than we ha had gotten used to. Uh, how can we cooperate? How can we learn from each other? And in order to try to answer some of these questions, uh, we here at Dees are very happy to, to, to have a distinguished panel of experts with us here today. Um, and I will introduce each of these panelists in turn as they speak. Uh, but to start us off, we now have uh, Professor Anas Viul. Uh, Anas is a Professor MSO at the Institute for Political Science, University of Copenhagen. Anas's research focuses on, among other things, international relations theory, foreign policy analysis, small states foreign policy, the Nordic countries, uh, and on a side note, Arnas was also my PhD advisor back in the day, so I'm very happy to see him here again. Uh, Arnas will talk about small states in the Baltic Sea region, navigating between hard and soft. And without further ado, I'll, I'll pass on the word to Arnas. Arnas, thank you. Thank you very much. I guess everyone can uh, can hear me, and I think uh, the coordinator will put on the video uh, also. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, if you can see me now. We don't have the video yet, but we'll just work on. Yeah, now we have it. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have some uh, slides that I want to share with you as you uh, as we go along. So thank you so much for inviting me uh, to uh, to this very interesting seminar, I think, and I hope, 
on uh, on small states uh, in the, on the security dynamics in the Baltic Sea region and and the prospects and uh, and consequences for the countries in the region, which are mainly small states, the Nordic uh, countries and the uh, Baltic states. I will talk a little bit about uh, how these uh, states. Uh, navigate how they can uh, navigate in what's going on now. And I will start from the outside on uh, what is it that is really uh, changing in the Baltic Sea area. I think Mikkel uh, put it very nicely, uh, pinpointing, of course, to 2014, uh, the Russian uh, annexation of Crimea. But I think we could see also the Russian annexation of uh, Crimea as more largely uh, a symptom uh, of a crisis in what we have become accustomed to call the liberal uh, international uh, order. Liberal international order uh, understood as an order which is stable, uh, which is backed up uh, by a hegemon, the United States, which is institutionalized and which is uh, in many ways an exponent of what we would broadly speak of as liberal values, as some kind of market economy, human rights, uh, liberal uh, democracy. And what we see in what we've seen in, uh, in recent years is a crisis or a change in some of the tenets of this uh, order. One uh, is uh, characteristic or one development is what some have called, and in particular in the US uh, foreign policy establishment has called the abdication of the United States. Uh, this uh, abdication, uh, as they call it, is not just a Trump phenomenon. It goes back at least uh, to President uh, Obama and is kind of the uh, gradual uh, moving back of the United States to focusing more uh, inwardly, less uh, on, uh, on being, if you will, the policeman uh, of the world. And one uh, aspect of this and one potential consequence of this pointed to uh, by Joseph Nye, Nye, among others, is what we call the Kindleberger trap uh, after uh, uh, Kindleberger, who was, of course, one of the architects of the Marshall Plan and pointed to the situation in the 30s as a situation where the hegemon did not take responsibility for providing the public goods, uh, goods in the uh, international uh, sphere. So if the hegemon, if the United States, the strongest power, uh, starts to withdraw what we will see is that perhaps no one uh, takes responsibility and we have a more complex, a more chaotic, a more conflictual potentially uh, international order. And this is repercussions for Europe uh, and is repercussions from, for the Baltic Sea. A second aspect is the rise of China uh, associated with what we call sometimes the Tukaditis uh, trap made popular by Graham Allison, uh, that when one uh, uh, challenge arises in uh, in an international order, there's a likelihood of war between the old dominant power here, the United States, and the new one, China, or at least uh, a, a conflict. At the same time, and amidst this, we see the decline of, uh, of old institutions, or perhaps rather the intergovernmentalization of old institutions, because the institutions are there, they're pretty stable, they're pretty resilient, despite recurrent crisis of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the conflict, of uh, economic crisis, of migration, terrorism, and, uh, and, uh, and now the corona pandemic, but they're not as effective as we would want them to be. And they're more and more uh, exponents of, uh, of national interests. And this is increasingly all seen by legitimate, by, by, by the great powers. So that leads also to my fourth point, the, what you might call the insert country first, uh, aspect of uh, of uh, the uh, crisis in the liberal international order. We've become accustomed to uh, to hearing about America first, but this is not about just about America first. What we've seen also in the European Union uh, over the past decades is uh, is an emphasis on national interest and an acceptance uh, that the great powers, they emphasize national interests more, they look more uh, to uh, what they want uh, to do and, uh, and are less uh, keen to use the institutional structures, more willing uh, to take the negotiations outside. This has uh, consequences for the order uh, that, uh, that we now start to, uh, to live in and do politics in. Uh, Quite often we will speak of, of the order in, in Cold War uh, uh, terms. We will look to uh, what is the systemic order? Is it unipolar? Just the United States is becoming bipolar. The United States and, and China is the great power. Multipolarity with rising powers, even more powers uh, seeking uh, to dominate the, uh, the international realm. Or is it really nonpolarity that we do not have 
a, 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 a situation where it is the powers of, uh, of, of systemic uh, uh, strength uh, that dominate uh, international policy. And I, what I think is, 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 is more likely and what we see a clear tendency is, is what we might call the regionalization of, uh, of international relations. And this regionalization is both a regionalization in terms of, of Europe in, the, in our part of the world and a regionalization also in, in terms of what you call sub-regions or regions in between perhaps some other regions like the Baltic Sea regions. And I have two developments here that are, I think, coexistent, but also quite different. One is the sphere of influence order. We've seen both China, Russia, the United States, even the European Union, when, uh, when uh, Ursula von der Leyen speaks of a geopolitical commission, uh, accentuating uh, spheres of, uh, of influence uh, from the great powers as a starting point for doing politics. China has the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the South China uh, uh, Sea. Uh, the United States speaks of the uh, favorably, or at least the Trump administration has done, of the Monroe uh, Doctrine. And you might say with the Baltic Sea perspective, unfortunately, uh, the Baltic Sea is quite close to, or perhaps uh, within, uh, what, what Russians think of as a Russian sphere of influence. But it's also within a, a US sphere of influence. It's also within a European or maybe even a, a German uh, a sphere of, uh, of influence. So we have a, a point of contention in the Baltic Sea be, be, between this. And at the same time, we have what we sometimes call a multiplex order, uh, which signifies that we have regional orders also, but the regions orders are more complex. They're not dominated only by states, but by multiple actors. Uh, they have uh, regional organizations as a basis for uh, doing negotiations and, uh, and, uh, and politics. And that coexists with this development of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the great powers doing more and, and accentuating their interests uh, more. This has consequences for Europe. Uh, Europe is uh, at the same time multiplex, uh, embodied in, in institutions like the European Union, uh, uh, NATO, overlapping institutions, both in terms of, uh, of uh, aim and in terms of, uh, of, uh, of membership. But Europe is also, a, 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 you might say, a, 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 a a strange phenomenon looking in many different directions in the north uh, we often look to the arctic uh, we look to the east of uh, of russia uh, in uh, in the mediterranean uh, area they will be much more concerned about the middle east and uh, and africa so the powers in in europe germany and and france are also kind of drawing pulling in different directions on uh, on, on on what europe should be and at the same time we have a, a discussion of of european or even eu strategic autonomy that Europeans should be able to act uh, alone in a, in a situation where we are less sure of the United States that we used to be, that we see less joint interests with the United States that we did uh, in, uh, in the past. With this kind of combination of, uh, of multiplex, of several uh, spheres of influence coming together, both within the European uh, area and, uh, and from powers like, uh, like Russia, United States, to some extent, uh, even China uh, from the outside, I would say uh, EU strategic autonomy. Let's hope not, uh, because uh, uh, what we need is uh, is not a, 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 an autonomous Europe, uh, but a Europe that can maintain its own interest within uh, and in cooperation uh, with uh, US uh, interests. For the Baltic states, for the small states in the in the Baltic Sea region, this has uh, important uh, consequences. There's a risk of, uh, of marginalization. Uh, the Baltic Sea region, I think uh, Michael put that well in, in, uh, in, uh, in his introductory uh, comments. Uh, also, the Baltic Sea region might be coming back and has been coming back since 2014 in attracting attention, but still it's attracted much more attention in, uh, in the Nordic and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Baltic and North European uh, area than uh, then outside, uh, if you look from a systemic level, if you look at the, uh, the debates in uh, the United States or, or China, they're not so much concerned about the Baltic uh, states or the Baltic Sea region, the Nordic states. They are concerned about East Asia. Uh, they are concerned to some extent about the Arctic. Uh, and in many Europeans, European uh, discussions, there will be a concern about the Mediterranean, uh, uh, Africa, uh, the Middle East, uh, Turkey. So there's a competition uh, between uh, uh, these uh, areas on getting the attention and getting the resources necessary to maintain and develop security structures. There's a risk of, uh, of uh, 
what we sometimes call uh, parallel action and what, uh, what uh, Mikkel and, and Trine's colleague uh, at, uh, at uh, Dies Hans Mauritsen uh, termed uh, parallel action uh, many years ago, uh, even when, when analyzing the, uh, the, the Cold War. Uh, when you agree on, uh, on goals, as we largely do among uh, the, uh, the, the states in the Baltic Sea area, but we have incentives uh, to go it alone, or maybe it's not even always a, con a consequence of different incentives, but of living in different bubbles, being mainly uh, concerned with our own uh, worldview. And this is kind of also uh, uh, a, a situation which is uh, which is, is pulled also by by great powers doing divide and uh, and rule uh, in, uh, in in the great power politics between uh, these uh, smaller states and uh, and allies. And that's of course the risk of overload uh, since 2014. Uh, we have uh, uh, put many more resources into the Baltic Sea area. Uh, I, I think which which has been a good thing. Uh, but at the same time. Uh, we are at, uh, at, uh, at we, we feel the pressure overall in in uh, in the Baltic Sea region, also uh, to focus on many many other uh, aspects of world politics and other regions, and it put an immense pressure on both diplomatic and uh, and military uh, resources. So, the big question uh, with all of these challenges is, of course, uh, what should we do about them? Uh, first, uh, we might accept that uh, the Baltic Sea region is a region at the fault lines. Uh, it's a region at the fault lines between different spheres of, uh, of influence, Russian, US, European as EU, European as uh, German, uh, European as also Nordic and, uh, and, and Baltic, and even uh, uh, Chinese with the, Bal with the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative also uh, moving close to, to the region. This underlines the increasing importance of uh, Baltic Nordic uh, networks. Uh, what is it that we share? Uh, we share goals of stability and development in the region. Uh, we have different competences and uh, networks uh, that uh, allows us to uh, pursue uh, these uh, common goals. So how is it that we can connect and interconnect uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of pursuing uh, these goals? How can we map uh, our uh, networks, our interests, see what shared interests uh, and where we might build uh, on each other's competences and, uh, and connections to, to, to other states. The increasing importance of European security uh, cooperation, I think the increasing uh, uh, in our part of the world, the increasing importance of how Germany positions itself uh, within this European security cooperation. Uh, Germany is, uh, is an increasingly important Power also when it comes to security for uh, for for the Baltic uh, Sea area and the German outlook uh, is uh, is important for the EU outlook and for the resources or also diplomatic that the EU will will spend in uh, in the region. So for that in, for that reason, it's important uh, for the states in uh, in the region, the small states in the region, also to interact uh, uh, with. Uh, uh, Germany on, uh, on, uh, and the EU on, uh, on this. And then a workable uh, transatlantic uh, relationship. Uh, we might uh, be sad that the uh, attention is turning away from, uh, from Europe. Fortunately, we can say the Baltics has, has drawn a bit of attention to it uh, again. But what we need is to, to forge a relationship with the United States where both the small states in the region and the United States get something out of it. Whether we want it or not, uh, the uh, the international sphere has become more transactional. It's not just a Trump phenomenon; it's also a phenomenon of overload in a globalized uh, international uh, system. And we need to show why the Baltic uh, area is, uh, is, uh, is is important, not only to us but also to the strong actors outside us. So I'll end on uh, on uh, on uh, on a little bit more specific, 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 and perhaps also a little bit more optimistic view. I think there are some uh, important uh, lessons that we can draw uh, from the past. If we look back to the Cold War, that was uh, in many ways a successful uh, a period uh, for uh, for the Nordic uh, countries amidst a very difficult. Uh, situation in terms of a balance of, uh, of, uh, of terror. Uh, what was it that the Nordics did well? I think one thing I would point to is, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, Brunson's uh, concept of organized hypocrisy. 
that in any organization there will be a, some kind of strain between what you do and uh, and uh, and what you say. Uh, and uh, I think we need to organize our hypocrisy in a in a in 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 a way uh, that will further our security interests. And I think that will mean a stronger division between high and uh, and low politics. That we accept that when it comes to high politics, national security. The U.S. Uh, remains vital for our security interests. We need that anchor, uh, not least in the uh, in the Baltic Sea. But when it comes to low politics, that a lot we can do, and that we do already in terms of uh, of network. And, and interesting, I think that uh, that the main European actor for us, Germany, falls in somewhere in between, uh, and we need to figure out uh, how to approach Germany. Using your geopolitical location as an asset, what you do not want to be in a in a in a in a world like the one that is uh, is is developing is uh, is forgotten uh, by the uh, by by the strongest powers. And I think we have a good uh, point of departure for showing both that we are competent in the Baltic Sea region, competent in providing security uh, solutions, but also that we are important to the stability in Europe uh, as. Uh, as such, and we should do that both by seeking shelter uh, with Germany and not least the United States, but also developing our own uh, networks and nation grants. And even if we do that, dilemmas will remain. Embracing a soft agenda in the region, uh, seeking to uh, to strengthen uh, security ties among all actors uh, in the region, also uh, to some extent including Russia, but pursuing hard uh, uh, deterrence. Uh, in order to uh, to make sure that something like Crimea will not happen again, and agreeing on policy when we see that even though we see that Nordics and Baltics are coming together and closer together in their threat perceptions, uh, there's still differing threat perceptions, and not least between our most uh, important outside uh, actors to the smaller states here, uh, Germany and uh, and the United States. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, for uh, introducing us to the region, for setting the bird view perspective. Uh, I think you introduced it very nicely as a region of fault lines between the great powers in which the small states, which the small states have to deal with. And I think you very nicely lay out uh, some of the most important dilemmas that this presents them to. Now, having the overall picture in place, we will now proceed on with the, with the next speakers. Uh, who will all, uh, in, in various ways, zoom in on more specific dynamics of the region. Now, before uh, moving on, I uh, just want to take a minute to introduce the Q&A function. Uh, I can see some of you have already found it, which is great. Um, so uh, the way we will do it is we will hold questions until, until the end, but uh, I will encourage you to simply just ask the question in the Q&A function uh, or, uh, already now, then uh, when we come to the Q&A uh, session, uh, I will uh, go through the questions that have been asked and, and, and uh, then I will read them uh, uh, to the panel and then we will have a discussion based on that. So please uh, do not hold back. Uh, ask all the questions you want in the Q&A function. Excellent. Okay, we move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Maria Malkso. Uh, she is a senior lecturer in international uh, security uh, at the Brussels School of International Studies at uh, the University of Kent. Her research focuses, among other things, on conflicts over historical memory and on deterrence in NATO's eastern flank countries. Today, um, she will talk about historical memory as a conflict zone. Russia versus its former Soviet East European dependence. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mikkel, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, hello, everyone. I tried to squ uh, share my screen. Here we go. Okay. So the story that I want to tell you about uh, when we think of historical memory as a conflict zone on the example of, of uh, Russia versus its former Soviet East European dependence, of course, reminds us of uh, the observation uh, of uh, historian uh, Hazen White. Uh, events happen, facts are established. So what we are witnessing here is, is a struggle over establishing facts. Um, and I want to start uh, with the observation that the debate over the rightful remembrance of the Second World War 
and more broadly the Soviet communist legacy between Russia and its former East European dependence has indeed become reheated with the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. Think of Russian President Vladimir Putin's uh, programmatic uh, address, uh, the real lessons of the 75th anniversary of World War II, which was published in the national interest in June 2020. Or consider the recent uh, Russian historical truth protection clause in its uh, constitutional amendments, as well as uh, Russian criminal investigation uh, after Czech authorities uh, dismantled the Soviet statue in Prague in the spring of 2020. Um, importantly, this contestation of historical memory between Russia and its former Soviet and East European dependence is increasingly becoming a legalized battle. In 2014, Russia introduced a memory law which criminalized public dissemination of knowingly false information about the activities of the USSR during the Second World War and also stipulated concrete penalties in case of this law's violation. Ukraine, when we think of the region more broadly, adopted its set of decommunization laws in 2015 post Maidan. And Poland, uh, which had criminalized the denial of Nazi and communist crimes already in 1998, has recently sought to penalize public statements that accuse the Polish nation or state of being responsible or complicit in the Nazi crimes committed by the Third German Reich with its 2018 amendment to the Act on the Institute uh, of National Remembrance. So you see that these memory laws, of course, are distinct in their aims, but they invariably seek to prioritize a version of historical memory and raise it above political contestation. They all seek to institutionalize a preferred national narrative of the past. Uh, as a legally defended and hence also politically untouchable single truth. And this narrative is then lifted above normal politics, something that uh, everyone in Copenhagen is, is very familiar with. Uh, by characterizing memory as an issue of state security or more specifically the security of state identity of a particular kind, historical memory is hence simultaneously sacralized and depoliticized. And this is a broader tendency uh, really across the region. It is pushed out of the political debate, public debate and subjugated to these restrictive legal frameworks of permissible discourse and acceptable remembrance practices. So these memory laws that I mentioned are also actually attempts to issue unsuitable memories while maintaining a particular narrative of the nation's identity. But when we talk about the uh, memory wars in the region more broadly conceived, then of course, we also have to remember that uh, these memory wars are not just wars in a metaphorical sense, because particularly in case of Ukraine, we have witnessed how they struggle to define and narrate the World War II related past as a foundation for present and future political identities uh, has been intricately intertwined with a kinetic conflict in Donbass. Some scholars have even described the current war in Ukraine as one that uh, has been effectively imagined, narrated and justified as a continuation of World War II in Russia, particularly. So Russia, of course, stands out uh, with its militant stance towards the historical remembrance of World War II in congruence uh, with the victorious powers uh, alleged right to define the legitimate frames of remembrance also for the rest of the world. Victory in the Second World War, or the Great Patriotic War as it is known in Russia, uh, was a major status boost for Russia's predecessor, the USSR, as it also marked the country's decisive entrance to the top league in the international system of states, allocating it the status, prestige and international position among the P5 of the United Nations. So due to this intertwined nature of Russia's national self-narrative as a primus inter pares among the uh, victors of World War II and its earned international status as a great power, as a consequence, uh, Russia is adamant about defending the right recognition of Russia's historical predecessor's role in the war. And consequently, uh, Russia is very concerned about you know, the possibility of this material status slippage 
as it you know sees these these contesters from the Baltic states, from Ukraine, but also Poland, of course, trying to sort of reassess and and regear this post 1945 Western mnemonical canon, which has been focused on the Nazi German aggression and and Nazi German international crimes. Uh, so what Russia effectively is doing, it vehemently opposes uh, any uh, downplaying of the USSR's role uh, in, uh, in uh, ending the Second World War. So consequently, in a rather notable history lecture uh, at the end of 2019, Vladimir Putin admitted being hurt by the European Parliament resolution of September 2019, which had stated the Soviet Union's co-responsibility for starting the Second World War with signing the Molotov-Rippentrop Pact uh, in 1939. Contrarywise, Putin pushed back uh, by blaming Poland for having signed a comparable non-aggression pact with Hitler in 1934, and, and also accusing Poland of, of participating in, in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia in, in 1938. Now, Polish Prime Minister Mateusz uh, Morawiecki issued a four-page statement in his term, accusing the Russian president of repeated lies over history of the war, calling Poland to stand up for the truth, not for its own interests, but for the sake of what Europe needs. So what, what we witness here, I would argue, is, is effectively competitive mnemonic security seeking. Uh, coordinated state level attempts at fixing distinct understandings of the past in order to bolster the state's stable sense of self, which is underpinning and enabling their political agency in the contemporary world, according to the assumptions of uh, ontological security studies, ontological security theory. So we can think of this mnemonic security and the quest for mnemonic security as a variation of ontological security seeking something that is allegedly central to the human condition. And of course, you know, we are used to think of security as, as the struggle for survival, but this idea of ontological security, including uh, mnemonic security, basically uh, thinks of survival as something that is not just about the survival of the body of the states and nations in international relations, such as, for instance, the territorial intactness or, or the uh, you know, inviolability of, of the sovereign institutions of the state, but also the uh, survival of a state or a political actor as a certain kind of actor. So it is about this, this uh, you know, defensive stance, uh, sort of battle for a continuous and stable sense of self and of course, importantly, having that sense of self confirmed by the others and thus being reassured about one's own continuity and confidence towards the world. Now, when it comes to the Russian and, and former Soviet or East European dependence readings of the cause and consequences and ramifications of this important uh, event of the Second World War, no matter that you know, it, it concluded 75 years ago, uh, obviously, you know, these, these assessments diverge fundamentally, both uh, at the collected or aggregated individual level, as well as collective levels of, of social remembrance. For Eastern Europe, by and large, uh, the USSR uh, was one of the aggressors in the Second World War, responsible for uh, the loss of the Jura uh, and or de facto sovereignty for the better part of the second half of the 20th century. Now, for Russia, as the legal continuator state of the USSR, uh, the Great Patriotic War, as I said, and the victory thereof, of course, marked the emergence of the Soviet Union as a great power internationally. So, accordingly, the USSR's role in the outbreak of the war via these secret protocols of the Molotov-Rippentrop Pact is accordingly relativized uh, by appealing on the exclusively peaceful goals of the Soviet foreign policy, Whereas uh, chasing the Nazis out of Eastern Europe is something that is celebrated as and exclusively as liberation, unacknowledging the de facto beginning of another phase of political occupation in Central and Eastern Europe. 
So you see against this backdrop that uh, the removal of Soviet World War II commemorative monuments across the former Soviet dominated space and the memory laws of Poland and Ukraine and the Baltic states insisting on their political subjectivity, which was violated by the Soviets. And of course, also these traditional, um, uh, sorry, transnational soft law counterparts of such memory laws uh, in the European Union and also Council of Europe, these have all resulted uh, in very wounded and militant reactions on Russia's part and intense accusations of historical revisionism thereof. Now, this is, this is interesting and this is important because since the 2008 foreign policy concept of the Russian Federation, Russia has publicly refuted historical revisionism, which is a tendency that it, of course, exclusively reserves for its former Soviet dependent states uh, and uh, oftentimes also West at large. The legal apex of Russia's nemopolitical struggle for sustaining its status uh, as a victorious great power was reached in spring 2014, as I also mentioned before, when uh, the Russian Duma, uh, the lower chamber of the parliament, adopted a memory law which uh, introduced criminal liability for infringements on historical memory with regard to the events of the Second World War. Inter alia, the denial of facts uh, related to the Red Army's actions during the war for the desecration of the symbols of military glory as well. And this, this law amended uh, Russia's criminal code uh, by imposing a punishment through a fine of up to 300,000 rubles or the deprivation of liberty for up to three years by Article uh, 3541, entitled Rehabilitation of Nazism. And this trend of criminalization or, or you know, even mnemonic constitutionalization, actually, uh, has continued uh, by the recently approved amendments uh, to the constitution of the Russian Federation, which now includes a clause on the constitutional protection of the historical truth. Namely, in March, the state Duma adopted its, its third and final reading of these amendments, which, as you know, were mostly about making sure that, that uh, Vladimir Putin would be able to remain in power even after you know, the end of, of uh, his current presidential term. But one of these amendments introduced a novel article uh, 67.1, which prohibits diminishing the importance of the heroism of the people in the defense of the fatherland. So you see that this sacred victory of the Great Patriotic War, which has effectively formed an ideological pillar of the Putin's regime, has now been elevated to the level of, of mnemonical constitutionalism. And this is obviously likely to further deepen the the already existing mnemonical uh, battle lines uh, across Eastern Europe, where you know countries like like Czechia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland have uh, criminalized the denial of communist crimes in that term. And you know, to conclude, I want to suggest that uh, this this name of the game in the region, and obviously not invariably, obviously with some some uh, some exceptions. Uh, some of these laws are more declarative, not all of them are punitive, but what we are witnessing is, is something that we can perhaps call a militant democracy. It's a common denominator for this governance of historical memory through a network of, of declarative and regulatory memory laws and policies and also various state-funded actors, such as these institutes of national remembrance in the region, which have been pretty, pretty vocal and powerful in, in the Polish and Ukrainian cases, for instance. So now, of course, you see how this, this uh, neologism draws uh, on the inspiration of militant uh, democracy which has uh, an effective self-defense against anti-democratic political parties and extremist movements and, and sentiments at its heart. Meanwhile, militant democracy applies this correspondingly militant defensive stance, not for the protection of democracy per se, but rather uh, for the sake of specifically defined understanding of the national biography or state identity. And of course, alike to militant uh, democracy, uh, militant democracy is in danger of self-inflicted harm to its object of defense, that is historical memory, in the very effort to defend it. Because these precautionary and punitive measures, in fact, reveal and reproduce 
rather than fix the state's mnemonic anxiety problem. So, you know, this it's effectively a mnemonic uh, status anxiety induced governance reflex, if you will, and therefore it's more revealing than it is healing. Instead of the sort ironing out of the wrinkles from one's inevitably non-linear past experiences, these restrictive and punitive memory laws uh, actually expose and, and reproduce rather than settle uh, a state's mnemonic anxiety problem. So in practical policy terms, what this means is that these, these uh, tendencies of mnemonic security seeking, which compete with each other in the region and also happen via punitive memory laws, tend to be counterproductive to their original aim of defending and securing the respective national memories. So instead, they tend to reproduce and, and reinstate historical animosities between these different carriers of these competing memories. Uh, so, you know, unlike Professor Weevil, I'm, I'm afraid my, my ending note is not particularly optimistic, but, but there's that. And I, I look forward to the debate afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, um, <clears throat> for reminding us that the Baltic Sea region is not only about differing interests, but also about identity tied to different interpretations of the region's troubled history. For the next speaker, we will shift focus again a bit, now looking into gas politics. The next speaker is my good colleague here at DEES, Trine Willumsen berling Trine is a senior researcher here at DEES. She is currently um, uh, funded by a Carlsberg Foundation grant on uh, where she works on energy infrastructure projects in the Baltic Sea region. And her research uh, focuses, uh, among other things, on the interplay between expertise, science and knowledge, and security politics. Today, she's going to talk about electrified geopolitics, the changing energy landscape in the Baltic Sea region. Trina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if my video is showing. It's not on yet. <clears throat> It's not on yet, no. Well, I'll start by sharing my screen then, maybe. <clears throat> start my video with that screen, yes. Now it works. Now it works, okay. And I'm sharing my screen. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for two very interesting talks this morning. Um, I'm amazed by the different perspectives you can put down on a region like the Baltic Sea region and still make sense of it. Uh, and that's perhaps why it's so complicated to study. Um, I will talk about energy today. And uh, for this talk, I, I just changed the title uh, slightly, but it's still the same talk. Energy in the Baltic Sea region, sticky or disruptive. Um, energy policy is often not considered a matter of, of, of high politics, but it is certainly a form of security politics. And it's, it's a form of geopolitics as well. Um, recently, it was argued that the climate agenda is potentially changing the global geopolitical landscape. Um, I don't know if you read The Economist, but recently they ran a story about China and how that country was seen as potentially breaking free from old patterns of, of dependence on fossil fuels um, to, to becoming an independent, yeah, that fell out. Um, an independent country relying only on the production of electricity. Because China has invested massively and smartly in minerals extraction to be used in, for instance, solar power panels. And they are building up nuclear energy. Um, they say that they can come up to at least 45% of their electricity uh, consumption each year within a very short period of time. And this is a captivating idea. So if you refocus from China at the global level and to the Baltic Sea region, it's interesting to see how those kinds of, 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 of uh, developments will play out here. Um, so what, we, what I'll do in the next 10 minutes is basically to say, where were we and where are we going uh, today in the Baltic Sea region in terms of, of this shift from fossil to, to electrification. 
with the caveat that gas can of course be used to to produce uh, electricity as well but we'll uh, take that in the q a so basically okay i'm trying to shift now my slide here we go so this is the romantic picture seen from denmark we tend to focus here on wind green transition and a carbon free future um, the story is a little more complicated than that and I will argue, and as I have done, if you read Danish in, in the next um, issue of Raison, um, Isabella Suvilio, a postdoc at DIES, and I will, will argue uh, that we have to look at two tracks in the Baltic Sea region. What's written here in yellow in, in the lower part of the screen, there's a gas track and there's an electricity track. And those two tracks are really important to follow uh, for the coming um, dependent situation in energy security over the next decades. So the Baltic Sea region, this is a photo of um, breaking free, you might say, from all dependencies. This is the LNG terminal independence, it's actually called, in Lithuania. Uh, and it has a story of why this uh, terminal uh, came about. Because as we've just heard, the Baltic Sea region was divided for decades politically during the Cold War. And when independence swept over the region, we were happy, optimist, but the energy systems were not liberated at the same speed. For our neighbors in the Baltic states and Poland, the gas pipelines were in place and they still are. They run from east to west, not respecting boundaries, basically leaving Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland as recipients of Russian gas. In some countries, some of these countries still depend 100% on Russian gas supplies and also goodwill. Because as we saw in what, this is the Ukraine crisis coming before the 2014 one. In 2006 in energy, we have a very important crisis. It's called the Ukraine gas crisis. And it was, of course, the subsequent years, we had more of these types of crises. But basically, a dispute arose between Russia and its Ukrainian neighbor. And Ukraine is a huge transit country for Russian gas to Europe. Here we saw Russia, not as a technical glitch, but as a completely um, open policy switched off gas supplies to Ukraine because of a dispute. The Russian TV, even on the 1st of January, 2006, um, sent footage from the control room of one of the uh, uh, gas uh, interconnector sites where they saw the operators simply shutting down some of the pipelines and saying, look, we're doing this. We're shutting off gas. This means Ukraine is not getting any gas from us for reasons uh, outside of of the Russian uh, pipeline system, uh, Ukraine wasn't getting any gas from Turkmenistan either. So they were out of gas in the midst of a, well, lucky for them, a pretty mild winter. One of Some of the subsequent winters were not as mild. But what we saw here was openly gas becoming a policy tool and not just a policy tool, a security policy tool. So this is just to say the gas, the gas track is really important. And for that reason, and this is coming back to the picture on the screen, Lithuania invested and opened this LNG terminal. This is liquefied natural gas, which means the gas can be shipped on big container ships in a liquefied form and transported into the system in Lithuania as gas. And it can come from anywhere in the world. Um, it can come from the US, which is now becoming a net exporter of this form of gas, Australia even, um, Norway. But this is a way of getting out of dependence through diversification. So this really technical term of diversification is in our region, a very, very powerful um, security politics, uh, form of security politics. So now, even though they still depend on Russian gas in Lithuania, they are not as dependent on the whims in Moscow as they were before. Coming to the other end of the Baltic Sea, uh, in Denmark, where I'm speaking from now, 
we've benefited from oil and gas from the North Sea for a number of years. And, and we haven't really thought about energy as anything that we should worry about. Since 97, we've been self-sufficient in both uh, oil and gas. We even started exporting. So we didn't really see gas as a problem. But recently, and this is coming after the Ukraine crisis that Mikkel mentioned in 2014, we got a gas crisis of our own and it's called the Nord Stream 2 construction project. Suddenly after 2014, the Danish parliamentarians saw things in a different light. We had a pipeline that we actually permitted the construction of. It's the green line here in the photo. In 2009, we gave the permit to build the first Nord Stream pipeline. In 2012, it was operative and it has been sending 55 billion cubic meters of gas to Germany. Uh, since then, or at least that's the capacity. But in 2017, when we were asked again, can we double this? Can we double the capacity of the Nord Stream pipeline? We didn't like it. And our good friends in America, I, I know that you say we didn't get a lot of attention. We got a lot of attention on this pipeline, informally though. But we, they, we were really asked nicely and politely, but forcefully to stop this pipeline from happening. And Denmark actually, well, we held the ground, some would say. Some would say we just kind of uh, stepped around and didn't know what we were doing, but at least we held back the pipeline for two and a half years almost. And now, uh, as you might know, um, the pipeline is still not finished because of um, US sanctions. First to, uh, against the companies helping in, in, in the pipeline, uh, of the pipeline. And now because Sassnitz, uh, a small community on the northernmost coast of, of Germany, has also experienced uh, a number of sanctions um, coming from the US uh, Senate. So to conclude, gas is there and gas is often quite spectacular because you see if, you, if the gas doesn't flow, you feel it. You don't get heating in your, in, your, in your radiator at home. You see uh, the big lines with Russia openly shutting down gas, gas pipelines. And we see the Danish situation with Nord Stream 2 where we were really put on the spot. This is one of the situations where energy really reached the, the headlines uh, also globally um, because it obviously had a big power, Russia on one end uh, and then um, the EU on the other end, Germany. Uh, I like the way Anna's put it, we need to keep an eye on Germany because they really do have different kinds of policies in this area that are really not uh, all the time um, in sync with each other. The other thing I'll say about gas is that it's sticky. Once it's in place, you just don't change it that easily. So this is um, a lesson to be learned about uh, energy infrastructure. Once it's there, it tends to stay. So, uh, so uh, gas is an important uh, issue to keep an eye on. So the other track is the electricity track uh, in the Baltic Sea region. It hasn't received a lot of attention, but it's equally important, I would argue. The driver in most of the world to this uh, electrification trend has been the scramble to reduce CO2 emissions, obviously. In the Baltic Sea region, it has a double purpose. Of course, it's good for climate, obviously, but it also promises to disconnect the Baltic states from Russian dominance in the electricity domain. Because after independence, and I'm talking after 1989 here, the region suffered from a lack of connections to the European countries and to each other. It's actually been called an energy island. There really wasn't any connections to support um, the way uh, an independent electricity uh, system. And uh, very little was produced at home. And what was produced at home was often not considered good enough for Europe. So when uh, Lithuania, for instance, joined the EU, they had to shut down one of their nuclear power plants, Ignalina, because it was simply considered outdated territory. It was of the same kind as the Chernobyl, uh, power plant, um, nuclear power plant. So it was just not fit for Europe. And this added to the isolation of the Baltic countries in terms of electricity. 
we have seen, and I, I'm pretty sure that most of you haven't seen the headlines because they haven't been there. We've seen a, a, an improvement on the electricity side. S-Link 1 and 2 connect Estonia and Finland today. The Litpole link is connecting Lithuania and Poland. And the Nordbolt connection between Sweden and Lithuania have considerably raised the transit ca capacity sorry, between the Baltics and the EU electricity markets. This is important. And here we see a country like Sweden actually playing a huge role in, in trying to connect uh, the rest of the Baltic Sea region to the same uh, kind of system. However, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia are still synchronized with Brel, which means the electricity system in Belarus and Russia. So they trade with Belarus and Russia, even if they get cables from elsewhere as well. The EU has made it a, 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 one of the projects of, of common interest to desynchronize uh, the Baltic states from Brel. And as far as I can see, most of the, of the technical stuff um, and, the, and the construction has taken place and they intend this to, uh, to go through in 2025 so that the Baltics can shift from one synchronization uh, region, which is Brel, to the continental system through a connection to Poland. So, as is often the case, the devil is in the detail. And in the case of the Baltic Sea region, when it comes to energy, the detail also lies below the surface of the sea, in gas pipelines and in electricity cables. Sometimes they don't reach the headlines, but they are, as I say, equally important to gas pipelines. So there's a double purpose of electrification in the region. I just forgot to press this button before. Sorry about that. Reducing CO2. Obviously, we have a huge problem about uh, CO2 emissions in our region, uh, primarily uh, in a country like Poland, where coal is really uh, one of the big energy resources that they uh, rely on up to 80% of their electricity is produced by coal. So we need to do something about that. But we also need to disconnect from dependence on Russia. So I wanna stop or on an optimist note as well, because these two tracks uh, in the Baltic Sea region, they interweave. And the best long-term weapon might actually be another weapon than just merely gas or electricity, but simply renewable energy. With the global scramble for green energy, we might be looking at a silver bullet, as I put it there in red. You get a better climate and you get self-reliance in one shot. It's gonna be depending on the, uh, oops, that fell out again. It's gonna be depending on the electricity system coming up and working very, very well, integrating it, keep building those cables below the surface of the Baltic Sea. But it also simply depends on, on networks, cooperation in the region, getting the Nordic countries to enhance their already existing cooperation on the climate agenda and understanding that this is not just about climate. It's actually also about liberating our whole region from dependence when it comes to energy. And that's what I wanted to say today. Thank you, Trine, uh, for a very interesting talk and for bringing in the geopolitics of energy and to, for showing us just how difficult energy dilemmas can get. Now we will change focus yet again and try to look at the situation in the Baltic Sea region, specifically from a Baltic state point of view. Our next speaker is Thomas Jamalavikouis, uh, who is the head of studies at the International Center for Defense and Security in Estonia. Thomas focuses on issues pertaining to science, technology and innovation, defense industry, security and defense governance and management, uh, and foresight and resilience. Thomas will talk today about security and defense policies in the Baltic states, responding to global turbulence and regional challenges. Thomas, we're very happy to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mikkel. Can you see me? Still no picture as of yet. Coming up. 
Yes, now it's there. It's excellent. Hello. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you, Mikkel, for your kind introduction and for having me today. And uh, good morning to everyone from, uh, from beautiful Tallinn. Um, as Mikkel mentioned, I, I'll, I'll speak on, on uh, basically on the defense uh, side of the, of the entire security enterprise in the region and, and mainly from the Baltic uh, perspective. Uh, for a change, no PowerPoint from me. Uh, uh, so you can wander around a little bit, uh, maybe pet a dog, a cat or whoever is around you and, and uh, uh, listen to what, uh, what I say. Uh, indeed, as, as Mikkel said in the introductory uh, remarks, uh, we, uh, or the, the Baltic Sea region was uh, a region of stability and security and peace uh, uh, since the end of the Cold War. And when the Baltic states joined NATO and the European Union in 2004, we kind of this, had this you know, sense of mission accomplished and this sort of um, Fukuyama end of history, uh, if you like. And indeed, we, with time, we became even the, the, the most integrated uh, corner uh, of this region when it comes to integration into Western uh, uh, in security and defense institutions and economic institutions. So even compared to Denmark or Sweden or, or Finland or Norway, the Baltic states are much more comprehensively integrated in all these structures uh, than our Nordic and neighbors and partners. Uh, and uh, uh, to be honest, we still harbor, even, even with the sense of end of, of history and, and the mission accomplished, we still harbor some deep-seated anxieties about, and, uh, about uh, uh, Russia. Uh, and of course, some, uh, many, uh, many uh, Western observers and our partners and allies really have written this off as, as some sort of a uh, inability to overcome historical grievances, uh, some kind of historical complex, but uh, time has proven us, us quite right. Uh, and, and indeed, the first signs came in 2007 with the Brown Soldier uh, crisis in Tallinn, that uh, Russia is really not up to good, that Putinism is not, uh, not uh, ideologically a good neighbor to have. Um, and then there, were, of course, there was a war uh, of Russia against Georgia in 2009. This is when we really started screaming and yelling that uh, it's time to uh, start paying attention to what is happening and, and uh, uh, see that Russia uh, in less friendly terms uh, than, than we wanted them um, to see. Uh, and I, I will not probably go through all these uh, global trends uh, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, sort of shape and inform our defense policies in, in the Baltic states. Uh, I think Anders uh, covered very well uh, uh, some key elements of, uh, of this turbulence, if you like, in the international system. Uh, just a few highlights maybe from this, which are the ones that, that uh, uh, really mm, uh, concern us the, uh, in, in the defense community. And, uh, and those who are working with military power is that this confrontation between rising China and resurgent Russia uh, on the one hand and, and the West on the other hand is becoming increasingly uh, uh, ideological, uh, centered around issues of human rights, uh, freedoms, uh, democracy, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, things like that. And uh, this also has a very strong now uh, a military element. Uh, military power is back in vengeance. It is uh, it's a hard, a hard currency. Uh, the whole dynamic of suasion, counter suasion, uh, using military force, military instrument is, is again uh, a, a thing to consider. And, and also uh, the uh, Chinese and Russian approaches are becoming more and more direct in confrontations with, with, with the West, including in, in using the, the military instrument, even if these are kind of just uh, brushes, slight brushes, if you like, uh, rather than, than uh, war fighting. But still, these are the signs that, that things are go not going uh, very well. Uh, and of course, uh, Russia and China also not a problem just for, the, for their immediate neighborhoods and, uh, and, and the, the regions so that they define themselves as, as the spheres of privileged interest, uh, but also more globally. Uh, uh, they, they're militarily in different forms, they're present in, in uh, other regions, they're messing around, they're meddling uh, in, uh, and, and this, is, uh, this is also something to, to take into account. While our alliances have been lurching from one crisis to another, uh, take the EU, for instance, and now with the uh, Brexit uh, being, uh, being completed uh, uh, and other crises, migration crisis, financial crisis, uh, and so on, the all sort of undermine cohesion, solidarity, a sense of common, common purpose often, 
And also NATO had its own share of troubles uh, uh, and from the Baltic perspective also, uh, uh, we remember very vividly a recent example when, when Turkey was, was blocking the uh, update of the Baltic, uh, of the collective defense plans for the Baltic states, uh, simply because it felt that its security interests with regard to the situation in Syria were not catered well enough by the, by the alliance. Furthermore, I've, I would like to highlight also that for the defense circles, we're also, uh, surprisingly also concerned about the, the rise of authoritarianism and, and all the sort of uh, draw bridges uh, uh, across across transatlantic uh, area because that produces splits within our societies and between the societies, uh, uh, even close partners and allies. And that, uh, that sort of a thing, that dynamic undermines uh, the solidarity and cohesion of, 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 the, of our alliances. Uh, last but not least, uh, we're also very concerned about what I would call this collective madness, uh, uh, the, the uh, loss of critical thinking, uh, uh, extreme polarization, even tribalism, uh, very much driven by social media. And this, is, this has become an important factor in, uh, to consider in military affairs as well. And if you want to see uh, and read more th uh, uh, thoroughly how, what that means, uh, take a book by Peter Singer and one other quote, I can't remember, called uh, Like War. And you can, you can appreciate very well how social media uh, uh, penetration and all this ubiquitous connectivity, instantaneous connectivity uh, uh, also is impacting the, uh, the military affairs and the character of warfare these days. Uh, and regionally, of course, when it comes to the, considering the threats, it's all Russia, Russia, Russia for us. Um, it's a multi-domain threat. It's not only in the military domain. Militarily, of course, it's on land, in the air, in, in, at sea, in cyberspace, even in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it, it has positioned most uh, advanced uh, assault capabilities uh, in the vicinity of the, of the Baltic states. Uh, it's building bastion defense in Kaliningrad, uh, smack in the middle of the, of the Baltic Sea region. Uh, it has also uh, uh, making a, a very good progress in, in instituting the long range precision strike capability regime in its armed forces to be able to, to keep our, our allied forces and, and, uh, and the infrastructures at risk even further afield, not only in the Baltic Sea region. And of course, it's also manifest in, in other dimensions, uh, be it espionage, uh, political meddling, information pressure, uh, influence operations, exploitation of energy dependencies and critical infrastructure uh, vulnerabilities. So it, it is really a multi-domain threat for us. And, and I would probably not uh, will be wrong to say that for the Baltic states, we have a sense that it's an existential threat. This is something that you, you need to appreciate if you want to understand uh, uh, our, our thinking and, and our behavior and our actions, that we do think that, that, that Russia represents an existential threat. Uh, and, and for our overarching principle for guiding our defense policies is very simple, never again, uh, uh, meaning that we will never, never again allow our independence to be taken away without any resistance as it happened in 1940, and never alone encountering those, uh, the, this, this existential threat. So uh, there is a strong sense of understanding in the Baltic states that uh, in the face of all this turbulence, we must do our utmost to keep those alliances that we joined, those, those, uh, the, the frameworks that we joined, NATO, the European Union, as effective, as coherent, uh, as relevant as possible at, at, at all times. And also uh, uh, do our own homework uh, to those ends. Of course, the, the, I would call it maybe a great Crimea shock was a big, big kick in our backsides as well. Uh, to do more of that homework. And in the defense field, that was particularly pronounced because everyone understand that the threat is also very direct and, and also military. So we witnessed the rise of defense expenditures in, in the Baltic states. In, in actually in 2014-15, uh, Latvia and Lithuania had the highest growth of their defense budgets in the world, uh, uh, stripping even uh, uh, the filthy rich you know, Gulf countries uh, uh, and, and others. Uh, so now all three countries spend 2% of GDP and even more on, on national uh, defense, uh, complying with the defense investment pledge uh, that agreed by, by NATO. Uh, and, and collectively, we now are defense billionaires. Collectively, we spend more than 2 billion euros on, on defense, and Lithuania alone uh, uh, takes, uh, spends half of that, which allowed, of course, uh, for much substantive uh, uh, capability investments uh, uh, to, to a more substantive, more faster military modernization and buildup. Uh, uh, we invested in armor maneuver capabilities, in fire support, in, in air defense, in, in anti-armor logistics, C3I, 
uh, ammunition stocks, uh, training infrastructure. So many, many investments being done to boost uh, uh, our capabilities, but we are still very dependent on our allies uh, militarily uh, to be able to deter uh, aggression and defensive uh, should the deter deterrence fail. Uh, we also saw a steady increase in our force structures and military personnel numbers, uh, and also made some legal and organizational adjustments. Uh, uh, some of them even, even uh, were noticed in Moscow. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, although Lithuania had it for a while, but Latvia recently also updated its legislative framework, allowing to uh, military units to resist uh, military aggression without even even uh, waiting for the, for the orders from uh, from the high command and for, for the political authorities, which actually impresses Russians, saying, "How come you know some majors and lieutenant colonels can order military action without waiting orders from above?" Which is probably inconceivable in Russia, uh, but that that sort of a thing is is being taken notice in in Russia. And we also practice and cultivate it very strongly. What is termed as whole of society and whole of government approaches to defense uh, uh, and, and also emphasizing societal resilience. And uh, one of the very basic things, of course, was, was uh, 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 for instance, in Lithuania, introducing conscription, uh, mandatory military draft, uh, the very first country in the West to do so ever since the end of the Cold War, to go back to the, to the conscription. Uh, uh, and that was followed by Sweden a few years, uh, a few years later. Uh, but also particular attention is being paid uh, even by the military planners and, and defense uh, planners to countering persistent disinformation, especially the one that, that is targeting the legitimacy of our institutions, uh, political system, uh, uh, the uh, trust in the government uh, and its ability to defend, uh, uh, organize the defense of, of the countries, legitimacy of our foreign and security policies and defense policies, and also the reputation of our allies. So. Uh, this, this is a, a very important aspect of, 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 def of national defense in all three Baltic states. I think one of the big uh, thing, uh, uh, great things we've done, and, and I think it's academically, it's a very interesting uh, case study to look into, is uh, how our efforts to persuade the allies, to persuade the alliance, to take, uh, again, to, 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 to elevate collective defense and the alliances uh, of the alliance's territory to the, to the top priority, uh, of the alliance, uh, how, how well it succeeded, uh, sort of basically turning this huge tanker around uh, after uh, uh, after the Crimean uh, crisis uh, uh, was uh, took place. Not only not only because somebody in Washington thought it was was absolutely necessary, but also the Baltic states they uh, acted on the basis of a common threat perception, and that 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 action was very important in in, in mobilizing the allies and changing the you know, the direction of the of the alliance. Uh, but of course, the Baltic states also involved in this, a lot of this uh, solidarity building with, with the allies, uh, trying to be militarily involved uh, uh, outside uh, uh, the alliance and, and, and assist the allies in, in, in addressing their security concerns. So they're still involved in international operations, uh, uh, for instance, in Mali. Uh, Estonia, Lithuania are, are all, all involved in, in, in uh, French-led and UN-led efforts. So, you know, there is still effort to perhaps avoid, while avoiding this, what Anders mentioned, the, the overload, uh, still cater to the security interests of, uh, and, and try to show solidarity uh, with the security concerns of our allies to make sure that they understand and hear us. And we also noticed, uh, uh, observe uh, quite, a, you know, quite a rise in the interest in the EU defense cooperation. So not only NATO, um, and there's a mix of factors in that. Uh, one is risk management to, to hedge against the, maybe the worst manifestations and the implications of this America first and the breakdown of transatlantic uh, uh, relations. But there's also a bit of a opportunism because there is money coming along uh, with all these EU uh, defense initiatives. Uh, and also a political imperative to, 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 to be good team players uh, within the European Union. Um, we also show quite a lot of high, uh, the interest in regional uh, cooperation formats, the Northern Group, the, the Nordef Corps, we also have bilateral, trilateral Baltic uh, cooperation, and experimenting with the new formats like the so-called PLUS, Poland, Lithuania, United States. But I think uh, uh, one of the most not noteworthy ones, which is uh, uh, 
probably the only one which combines all uh, countries in the region and includes uh, uh, a power from outside in the lead and also has a tremendous military value is JAF, Joint Expeditionary Force led by the UK, which has all the Nordics, all the, all the Baltics, uh, plus the Netherlands and is under the lead of, of the United Kingdom. And that is a very important to us. But we also were very keen to keep, to keep Sweden and Finland, Sweden nice and close to NATO as much as possible, uh, understanding that they don't want to join NATO maybe at, at this point, in time, but this is a very important. These are very important partners for the Baltic states uh, uh, in terms of of, uh, of uh, increasing security in the region and and having a greater deterrent effect to, to Russia's attempts to dominate uh, this, this this space in the Baltic in the Baltic Sea. Uh, so the military power is back back with engines. Of course, there are big big challenges in all these uh, uh, efforts. Uh, first of all, for us uh, is to to prevent abandonment by allies, you know, cultivate the allies, you know, engage the allies to make sure that the more of those allies in the region that they're constantly in, in, interested in us and, and prevent some reputational issues that are arising with uh, concerning our domestic politics, especially in Estonia, uh, from spilling over and maybe undermining uh, that, that uh, uh, cooperation and or the reputation, if you like, of, of the Baltic states in, in, in further afield. Uh, also, uh, trying to balance deterrence by punishment and deterrence by denial. So, so far, everything is configured too much towards deterrence by punishment, so rapid reinforcement by NATO uh, 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 and an ability uh, also of NATO to, to incur costs upon Russia's aggression. Uh, but then, you know, there is this point that Russia can punish back. So uh, uh, we need to build more stronger uh, deterrence by denial, but we lack capability uh, in place, or both the, uh, in terms of uh, uh, allied presence, which is still a tripwire force, uh, uh, all these uh, battalion battle, battle groups that we have, but also in terms of our local indigenous capability, national capabilities, because gaps are still galore and multiple, and we need to address them in, in many domains, but especially in the ones that we neglect, like maritime domain, uh, air domain. And the new domains, uh, although we did a big progress in addressing and, and building up our cyber capabilities, now there's a brand new operational domain, outer space. And then we have to think about how to integrate that one in, into, our, into our defense thinking. Uh, and, and also uh, now the big challenge is to sustain the uh, uh, consensus uh, of our societies and their support to, to maintaining the defense spending levels that we've achieved and maintaining that, that effort that we're doing in, in, in building up national defense because uh, um, the corona crisis is affecting public finances everywhere and the Baltic states are not an exception. Uh, plus, Russia is doing its utmost to undermine that societal consensus, uh, erode it. And, and this is becoming a very important uh, aspect. But furthermore, I think it is important to, for us in this whole of society uh, framework also avoid to securitize, uh, avoid securitization of every aspect of life, which is a distinct risk now when living on, in the shadow of Putinism, that everything, uh, every, every trouble, every problem, every issue will come to be seen uh, through the security uh, prism, uh, through the prism of threats. Uh, and, and that is not healthy for, for further development of, of our states and societies. And last but not least, I think uh, dealing with China's rise will become a, a, another major challenge, uh, of course, in, in, in its own right. Uh, China is becoming present in the region. Even militarily, uh, the Chinese military vessels participated in the exercises uh, 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 led by Russia in the Baltic Sea uh, fairly recently. But also indirectly, whatever China does uh, uh, and then creates any crisis uh, that diverts attention from us and from Russia's shenanigans. So there is always a concern that that uh, when if Russia if China does something drastic and that uh, uh, channels away, for instance, U.S. Uh, U.S. attention, that will undermine our our security. But overall, I think uh, it, it, uh, for the key key organizing term for, for the defense uh, planners here in the Baltic states, of course, is deterrence. Uh, just like in the energy sector is diversification, in the military field is deterrence. But while in energy terms, diversification is very clear and e easy to measure uh, its success, in military field, measuring success of deterrence is a bit more tricky. And, and the question is, you know, because it lies in the eye of the beholder. And the question is, uh, uh, the fact that we don't have a military action, direct military action, hot military action in the region, does that mean that Russia is deterred? 
or is just waiting for a better opportunity, or maybe it doesn't have a proper intent uh, 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 to this effect. So, uh, uh, you know, is, is it really deterrence that, that is at play here? And, and, and I think that that's uh, one of the key questions is, is to know and understand Russia. But the broader terms is, is uh, in the Baltic states, we pride ourselves in, in Russia's knowledge and Russia's understanding. But this is becoming problematic as well, because uh, a very basic thing, the, uh, the knowledge and skills in Russian language is deteriorating uh, and the younger generation no longer speaks and understands Russian, uh, Russian language. And that in the long term will become a big problem in trying to understand Russia and read its, uh, read its uh, intent properly. So I will stop here and uh, look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, and thank you for bringing in the Baltic perspective. Uh, now, again, uh, we will try to expand focus a little bit um, uh, by also trying to bring in the Nordics. So our next speaker is Håkon Lone Saxi, uh, Associate Professor at the Norwegian Defense University College. His research interests uh, include Norwegian uh, and Nordic military strategy and defense, German and British military strategy, EU foreign and security policy, and Nordic cooperation. Uh, and today he will talk on prospects for increased Nordic and Nordic Baltic defense cooperation in the light of the developing security situation in the Baltic Sea region. Thank you very much, Håkon, for being here. The floor is yours. Håkon, I think you have to, yes, unmute. Excellent. All right. Good. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mikkel, and, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be back uh, at DIES in Copenhagen, if only virtually in this case. So, uh, so thank you for that and, and following up on, on such a distinguished group of, uh, of researchers. Uh, I think you've done a good job of laying the groundwork from, for what I will be talking about, which is uh, mostly Nordic, but also a little bit of Baltic defense cooperation. And what have we done uh, over the last few years and where are we today? I don't have any PowerPoints, so I'll, I'm going to have to try and be very clear and precise um, in, in my talk so that it's, it's easy to follow. Um, and we're a little bit behind schedule, so I tried to stick to about 10 minutes. So I can see Mikkel um, sweating and looking at his watch. So, uh, so we'll try to, try to uh, cut some corners. But anyway, um, I'll talk about Nordic and Baltic defense cooperation, and I'll, I'll basically talk about three things. I'll talk about operational cooperation between the Nordic states. I'll talk about cooperation on capabilities and material between the Nordic states. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about where the Baltics fits into this perspective. But to start with, um, with the most important, I think at the moment aspect of Nordic defense cooperation is the operational cooperation. Uh, and by operational cooperation, I actually mean the ability to, in times of crisis and war, work together um, to do what we in military lingo call combined joint operations. So combined meaning multinational, multinational more than one nation and, uh, uh, and joint meaning all the services. So that the Nordic states are basically at the moment looking to make sure that they're able in a crisis or in a, in a war, an undeclared but nevertheless a war, to work together, to have their militaries work together multinationally and across all the services. Um, and this is something, uh, development which has been going on for the last, uh, not only, but I think it has intensified significantly since the Ukrainian crisis and has become much more a dominant part of uh, Nordic defense cooperation. And the reason for this is, of course, the deteriorating security situation which the Nordic states have been facing since the outbreak of the Ukrainian crisis, um, where, to put it, uh, you know, it wasn't only the Ukrainian crisis we had seen this development before, but it, it, it certainly evoked all the Nordic states to the challenge now posed by, by Russia. And whereas previously, if you go back 20 years, state security, a major crisis in the Nordic region involving a hostile great power using military force against the Nordic states was seen as, as a very unlikely event and certainly a broad 
large multilateral crisis in the Nordic region of this sort was seen as very unlikely. It's still unlikely today, but unfortunately it can no longer be ruled out. And this has become therefore um, a dominant focus in, in Nordic uh, uh, cooperation. Now, I think it's very important to stress that uh, the Nordic states have met this development with uh, this deteriorating security environment with, with two main strategies. Firstly, they've tried to increase their own military capabilities to enhance uh, deterrence and defense. This is what we in international relations call internal balancing. So all of them are spending more on their armed forces and all of them have redirected, refocused their armed forces towards their own territory and their own home region to deal with security challenges at home. Which isn't that significant a change for Finland, which never took its eye off the ball and was always focused on its own region at home and territorial defense was always the main priority for the Finnish defense forces. But it is a big shift, I think, in particular for Sweden and Denmark, which was much more expeditionary oriented. And it's also, uh, to a certain extent, a shift for Norway, um, which was more focused on, on, on its near abroad than, than Sweden and, and Denmark, but nevertheless uh, more expeditionary oriented 20 years ago than, than today. So, but of course, the Nordic states are, as you all know, small states. So their ability to deter and defend is limited. So the second part of their strategy is to strengthen ties with their most significant allies and partners. And this is something they've done very consistently, all of them since 2014, whether they're members of NATO or not, whether they're members of the EU or not, they've all sought to strengthen ties with, with, the United, with these organizations and with the United States and with the main European, uh, NATO and until recently EU countries. So the U United Kingdom, France and Germany and, and, and other uh, significant allies and partners. So the enhanced Nordic defense cooperation is only one small part of their, what we call in external balancing, this strengthening of ties with significant allies or partners, but it is an important part of that. Um, and what are some of the examples of what they've done in order to, to strengthen their operational cooperation? Well, I think the first example we saw was with uh, Sweden and Finland. Um, Sweden and Finland had, uh, all, have enjoyed for years close uh, security and defense cooperation, but after the Ukrainian crisis, um, something significant happened. They agreed that their armed forces could discuss and develop operational plans for how to uh, act jointly in, in the case of a major uh, crisis uh, in the Baltic Sea uh, area. And this was significant. Um, this sort of permission had not been given previously. And of course, it is very significant because, the, as you know, Sweden and Finland are military non-aligned states. So it is interesting that their, uh, their senior military leadership are developing plans to act jointly together with another state. In the, in the region to, to deal with common security challenges. Uh, of course, there is a very important caveat to these agreements, uh, which said that this in no way implies any sort of security policy obligation to act jointly. Nevertheless, of course, it sends a very strong signal, which is of course the intention. It sends a strong signal to any potential adversary that Sweden and Finland have the, the capability, they have developed the plans, they have done the planning, the preparations to act jointly in the case of a security policy crisis in their narrow world. And they even amended their national legislation to enable their governments to make these sort of decisions very quickly without having to consult, for example, parliament. Um, and they amended their national legislation to uh, enable these sort of, to give and receive this sort of military aid in a, in a crisis. I think that was a very important development. And I think what we're seeing now is that this sort of cooperation is being extended to also include NATO countries. So the most recent example we saw in September when Norway, Sweden and Finland signed an agreement to extend their operational cooperation and to look at, and I have the, um, the text of the agreement here, which is interesting to look at. It was a they, the, the objective is to discuss relevant national operational plans between Finland, Norway, and Sweden in areas of common concern. And they will look at the possibility of, um, of coordinating their national operational plans. Now, of course, that doesn't sound like a very high level of, 
ambition, they're going to look at the possibility of coordinating the national operational plans. But actually, it is, it is a very significant development because Norway is a member of the NATO alliance, uh, whereas Sweden and Finland are, as you know, military non-aligned countries. So Norway very closely aligns its national military planning with uh, the NATO alliance and with key NATO allies. And it also says in the text, which was controversial in Sweden, um, that um, they will, uh, the trilateral, uh, they will have the ambition uh, to be able and ready to conduct operations in crisis and conflict, if so decided, noting that Norway plans to transfer uh, to NATO, operational command to NATO in crisis and war. Uh, that particular line in the agreement was um, was controversial in Sweden, and supposedly, I've been told, was had to go all the way up to the Swedish government. Um, of course, there is a normal caveat about this: no, in no way, and entails any sort of um, of mutual defense obligations. Nevertheless, of course, and that is of course the point of the agreement, is that um, now they can start uh, aligning their national operational plans. Hopefully they will be able to do so. There, there's been some work done already, um, which is not public, but might be made public in the future in order to signal to a potential adversary that they have this ability to work together. Uh, and that of course implies also that Sweden and Finland is now coordinating its national operational plans, their war plans, if you will, uh, with, uh, with a NATO member state and, and hence with NATO to a certain extent. So, so I would say that this is this is a, a very interesting development, and I think that we will be seeing more of these kinds of developments in the future, also including uh, Denmark and and the possibly Iceland. Of course, Iceland will be limited because they don't have armed forces, but they will have an important uh, role as a staging area in any kind of operations involving the alliance in the Nordic Baltic region. So that's that's the uh, I think the main part. So if you take anything away from my talk here, this is this is where the action is at the moment. This is where where things are happening, and where I think things will be happening and should be happening in the future. Uh, and whether it's made public or not, I, I think that there will be some very interesting developments to to be had in this field. Let me then talk about a little bit about something where um, little is happening, but maybe something should be happening and where great ambitions have been held in the past, which is when it comes to capabilities and material. This was where the action was about 10 years ago in Nordic uh, Defense Corporation, in an era when Russia was a strategic partner, a difficult, but still a strategic partner. Uh, and the focus was on expeditionary operations uh, far away in, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, and at that time, um, because of the relatively, at that point, benign security environment, uh, the Nordic Armed Forces, um, their, the budgets of the Nordic Armed Forces was, was either static or shrinking somewhat. So for example, to take Norway as an example, our, what, our defense spending on G, uh, as a percentage of GDP declined from 3% of GDP in 1990 to 1.5% of GDP in about 2000. So, so it was halved. Uh, the, the purchasing power of the armed forces declined by about 40% in that, that period. Um, and so what we did for a long time is what, what all uh, most countries in Europe did is, of course, we, 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 slashed, we reduced the size of our armed forces. But of course, the Nordic states are small states. And so you reach a point where you reach this, what we call the critical mass. You reach the point that where you can no longer cut the number of main battle tanks, the number of combat aircrafts, the number of artillery systems, without reaching the point where it no longer makes sense to maintain that capability. And that, that was the point that armed forces, the Nordic armed forces reached about 10 years ago or, or so, one could argue. Um, and so the chiefs of defense in Norway and Sweden initially, and then in Finland uh, joined them, they decided that the solution was uh, multinational cooperation and particularly Nordic defense cooperation. So they wanted to integrate the production of military forces between the Nordic states in order to, to build more durable uh, forces that avoided this critical mass problem. So they wanted to purchase the same kind of equipment and do uh, joint training and exercises, joint logistics um, to merge the production of military forces. Um, whereas the operational forces would still remain national because uh, of course uh, that was vital in order to, to maintain national sovereignty and political freedom of action. Um, 
to make a long story short, this, um, uh, this ambitious endeavor was uh, not a huge success, unfortunately, because it turned out to be extremely complicated, far more than they had wished to, to integrate the production of military forces. And particularly the joint acquisition of material was extremely complicated. And there was a number of spectacular and rather expensive failures to do this. Um, and eventually, I think everybody realized that there was not the political will was not present to take the sort of painful decisions uh, that would have to be made in order to move jobs and, and to close down bases and to purchase uh, certain kinds of military equipment rather than other kinds of military equipment in order to make this a success. So just before the Ukrainian crisis, I think the level of ambition to, to do this sort of cooperation was very low. Um, and we have not yet, I think, reached a new point at where there is uh, ambition to do this. Yet, of course, it would make a lot of sense for the Nordic countries to do more joint acquisitions, to do more joint logistics, joint training, and so forth and so on. Um, so we might see more of this in the future, but I, I'm not super optimistic. So where do the Baltic states fit into all of this? Until recently, and particularly when the ambition was to develop capabilities and material jointly, they didn't fit into it uh, very much because they were small, they were far away, at least from the point of view of, of the non-Baltic Sea countries uh, among the Nordics, they were far away. They were culturally somewhat dissimilar, they didn't have comparable capabilities, so, so they were kept at an arm's length because it was difficult enough to do this sort of complicated integrated cooperation just between the, the core Nordic countries. Um, and to include the Baltic states uh, made it more difficult. And it wouldn't in, involve a lot of gains. Now, when the focus has shifted to more operational cooperation, I would be surprised if we didn't see more integration of the Baltic states into this cooperation in the future. It would make sense to integrate the Baltic states more because they're so tightly tied into the security challenge that the enhanced uh, operational cooperation is supposed to, to ad address. Um, um, but of course, there are a number of complications. There, the, these countries are NATO member states. Their, their defense planning is closely aligned with NATO. Um, Sweden and Finland are not NATO member states. They would have to find some sort of pragmatic way of, of dealing with that, the way that they, they're now trying to find a pragmatic way of dealing with that when it comes to, to Norway. So I think it would be difficult, but I think it would be a good idea. And I think it would be, I think it would be attempted, whether it would be as a success or not, I'm not sure. And it would be, it'd be largely up to Sweden and Finland, how far they would want to go in this direction. Um, but I think the Baltic states would probably welcome it and be positive because it would enhance their security, obviously to, to prepare in peacetime, what, how they will work with Sweden and Finland in, in a crisis and war. So I think they would be very interested in pursuing this kind of cooperation. So I think I've spoken for more than my fair share of time. I haven't really um, addressed Denmark a lot. Um, just very briefly, I can say that Denmark wasn't hugely interested in the old model of cooperation because it solved its critical mass problem by simply cutting all capabilities such as air defense, artillery, and so forth and so on, and focusing on some niche capabilities that it could deploy in expeditionary operations. So that's why Denmark was sort of on side and the sideline in the old capabilities and material focused cooperation of yesterday. Now that you're rediscovering your near abroad and focusing once again on meeting a you know, near peer competitor, to use the US lingo, uh, in your near abroad, you are redeveloping some capabilities that you previously abolished, such as air defense capabilities and such. So I think that now you will probably rediscover the critical mass problem, and then possibly you'll become interested in more not only operational cooperation, but maybe also capabilities and material type cooperation. So I'm optimistic about, you know, enticing Denmark to join more uh, Nordic defense cooperation in the future. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Håkon. And also for getting so concrete about the cooperation going on and the possibilities uh, uh, ahead. Uh, now, thanks to all the speakers for very interesting presentations that I think uh, actually have ended up complementing each other rather nicely. Now we move to the Q&A session. And as uh, Hokan also mentioned, we are running a bit behind and we have a big panel. So I want to make sure that all from the panel uh, can have a say uh, while covering as many questions from the audience as possible. Therefore, I'll try to direct 
our first round of questions to each of you, uh, and then uh, we can then do a round of answers with the entire panel. Uh, but feel free to answer also questions that I've directed to others if you so wish. Uh, but overall, uh, as we are, uh, we don't have that much time left. Uh, I will urge you all to keep your answers to two minutes max. But I will, uh, I will start out by uh, reading aloud uh, some questions from, from the audience, and then I'll supplement them with a few of my own as well. So, um, Rob Sagman asks uh, uh, Professor Anas Vihul, uh, he writes, Vihul speaks about Russian, US, and German spheres of influence in the Baltic Sea area, but are they the same kind of influence? Germany more economic and not willing to play a prominent role like the US and Russia, Russia certainly not in security. And then uh, I have another question for, and I think I want to direct uh, this one for uh, Thomas and Hokan. Uh, it's uh, my, my director here, Dies, Christian Fischer, that asks the role of mini lateral cooperation and initiatives in the Baltic Sea region. We have seen a substantially increased cooperation and political signaling from both Nordic, Nordefco, and NP8 fora in the years since 2014 and the Ukraine crisis. Also increasing cooperation when it comes to harder parts of security while still being complementary to EU and NATO cooperation. Is there room for increasing cooperation between the small states, uh, even more in the Baltic Sea area, where and how? Then, Maria, uh, you talk about uh, this battle of memory as a battle of different identities in search of ontological security. But I wanted to, to ask you also to the extent to which uh, you think that uh, the different Baltic Sea area states might also attempt to use memory uh, instrumentally, uh, much along the lines, he who controls the past controls the future. And finally, for Trine, Nord Stream 2, where do you see that project ending up? What will the Biden administration do? And what will Nord Stream 2 mean for, for the Baltic states and the Eastern European countries if and when it comes online? And with those questions asked, I think I'll start with Anas. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for, for some really interesting uh, presentations and, uh, and important and interesting questions. I think on the uh, on the question of uh, of spheres of uh, of influence, I think that uh, that you're quite right. I think they are <laughs> different kinds of uh, of spheres of influence, and I think that complicates uh, the matter. Also, I think they are spheres of influence that basically uh, reflect the security identity and strategic culture of uh, of those states, Russia. Uh, the United States, the EU, they also reflect the different institutional embeddedness of, uh, of these states and the different geopolitical locations. And I think that creates, and uh, that's part of, uh, of, uh, of, of the, uh, the idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of the multiplex world also, and how these spheres of influence uh, interact uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the European multiplex is that we have these different, uh, very strong uh, actors uh, contributing with different views of uh, spheres of influence, pursuing uh, their interests uh, based on these views of, uh, of spheres of, uh, of, of influence. And in doing so, they contribute to what we might call the European uh, multiplex of very different actors, uh, different uh, institutions that the smaller states in the region needs to, uh, to, to navigate. And, and I think what we need to do as uh, as, uh, as small states in the uh, in the in the Baltic Sea region is to acknowledge the differences between these uh, actors. Uh, we need to show these actors how we respond. I think in terms of uh, both the United States, the EU, and Germany, that needs to be an acknowledgement not only of uh, a shared base uh, of, uh, of, of values, but also an acknowledgement of, uh, of the kind of transactional aspects of, uh, of this. What is it that these actors will lose 
if uh, if uh, they're not engaged in the in the Baltic region, what is it that they risk if we have instability in the in the Baltic region? And in terms of uh, of uh, of Russia, of course, also uh, showing these bonds uh, to our allies and partners. And what I think that comes back to to the uh, to the to the uh, the the discussion uh, that uh, that uh, that that I think Thomas did uh, very nicely on the different kinds of uh, of, uh, of of deterrence. What is it that 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 what what is our response and uh, and uh, and and how is this response linked to the to the stronger acts? So I think we should work uh, to uh, to create it to make it more multiplex than sphere of influence, if uh, if you might say so, because I think that's in the interest of the smaller states of the institutional embeddedness and uh, and uh, the alliances but i think at the same time doing that we need to acknowledge that uh, that great powers and, and and stronger states they do have uh, different kinds of opportunities and uh, and, and different interests than, than than we have and we need to show them how these interests that we have are interlinked with uh, with their interests and opportunities Excellent. And now I think uh, we're going to 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 go to to the second uh, Zoom uh, uh, question for Hokon and Thomas. So wh why don't we start with Hokon and then we take Thomas afterwards? And uh, remember, two minutes. All right. Thank you. Um, so the question was on minilateral cooperation. Uh, what what space is there? I I think there is a lot of space, and there's um, it it is uh, I would say a necessity to do uh, more. Uh, minilateral cooperation of the type that we're doing in Nordefco and Thomas also mentioned the JEF, uh, the Joint Expeditionary Force Framework and other similar type project, uh, frameworks, Norton Group and so forth. And the reason why it's, it's a necessity is because the EU and NATO are such large heterogeneous organizations that it is almost impossible to get, I would say impossible, but it's difficult and, and very cumbersome and slow to get them to get something done in our region. Um, so in order to get things done, you have to work with smaller groups of countries using, you can use those larger organizations as a framework if you like. And of course the JEF uh, for is, is you know, theoretically a part of, uh, of NATO and a part of the NATO framework was introduced in the Wales summit. But of course, in reality, it is run by, by Britain and, and run by the, by the participating partner countries. And they're doing a lot of things within the JEF framework, which from a Nordic point of view, ties the United Kingdom closely to the security of the region and prepares the ground for, you know, in worst case scenario, a British expeditionary force arriving to the terror and if possible, and if necessary, defend the Nordic region. Um, similar types of cooperations are being undertaken with Germany through the Framework Nations concept, um, being undertaken in the Nordic region through Nordefco. Uh, the, the Northern Group is more of a talking shop, but serves a similar purpose. So I think these types of frameworks are very important. And you have the IPINE network tying in the United States and so forth. So these are very important frameworks and they should be developed and they should be tied closer together so that they overlap and complement one another. And it's not in any form of competition. And if you do that right, then, then I think that will, um, that will be the best way forward. Excellent. Thomas? Yes, uh, well, I'll strike a little a more skeptical note, perhaps, on that. Uh, one is is more theoretical reason that, at least in the, in the Baltic states, we try to also uh, take into consideration a very simple uh, issue that uh, too much regionalization and unilateralism could lead to splintering of NATO alliance, which is now reigns supreme in our in our in our strategic thinking and uh, uh, may contravene the principle of indivisibility of alliance. So uh, we should be very careful with that uh, and, and not overplay, you know, with with, with the unilateralism. But also, uh, you know, the Baltic states show that that you know there, there might be a lot of very strong reasons to to increase cooperation. But even between the three of us, all those strong reasons bring uh, produce very small results. So there's a lot of talk, but precious little walk when it comes to to, tri to trilateral defense cooperation. And we're also uh, slightly overwhelmed, you know, the, a lot of our attention is, is, is uh, turned to the nations that lead the, uh, and participate in the AFP battle groups. So a lot of these cooperation, you know, efforts are spent administrative time, human resources are spent in those directions. But this is not to say that that the, the, the Northern Bal Nordic Baltic operations and all those forces do not have value. And I, I would say that maybe it's also time to, 
to look into ways of making Northern Group a little more than a talk shop, simply because all the countries in the region are very interested in having the US involved heavily and deeply in, in, in our security. And, and now, so, so far, what we see is a lot of bilateralism, courting Washington on a bilateral basis. You know, that we've got a beauty competition between Copenhagen and Stockholm and Vilnius and Tallinn to get as much Washington as possible, but on a bilateral basis. And I think Northern Group could be a way, perhaps, to get a bit more regional approach in, 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 in having U.S. substantively involved and, and, and leading, actually, that cooperation. I think uh, maybe the U.S. leadership might even be back uh, with President Joe Biden uh, taking office in the White House, uh, and, and uh, perhaps we could have a little bit more hope uh, from from Northern Group framework is a, kind of one of those that that would be a major uh, of major importance in the region. Thank you. Then we move to uh, Maria and uh, memory politics. Uh, two minutes again. Thanks, Mikkel. So yeah, I, I focused on the case of Russia because you know it being the obvious elephant in the region. But but when we talk about the instrumentalization of the past for the purposes of the present. And, and when we talk about the links between these illiberal memory laws and, and populist politics, then obviously cases such as Poland and Hungary, even though you know, the latter not being the, the, the regional case, uh, so to speak, uh, also stand out because uh, effectively, yes, it does happen. Uh, you know, the instrumentalization of the past as part of the domestic politics uh, as part of the broader politics of resentment, uh, wherein also the narrative of, you know, the Western abandonment, the memory of the Western abandonment of Eastern Europe is very much part and parcel of the story of pursuing some kind of a sovereign regime of remembrance and, and setting, uh, getting it also recognized uh, in, in a way or, or, or other uh, internationally. So if you think of this uh, Polish attempts to, to to criminalize you know, what started out as, as the ban on, on the, indeed, an historical misnomer, Polish death camps, uh, but you know, eventually uh, ended up as a civil offense, uh, as, as this 2018 memory law. It's also about misremembering or, or you know, trying to sort of sediment the story of, of exclusively um, sort of uh, martyred Polish uh, memory uh, and, and nation against the backdrop of World War II and, and misremembering the, you know, Polish participation in the, in the events such as 1941 Jedwabne and, and 1946 Kielce pogroms. So it does happen on, on other sides as well. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Trini, before we uh, move to yours, uh, um, during the Q&A, two more questions have come up on gas, and I just want to read them to you uh, so that you can see if you can uh, perhaps uh, uh, touch a little bit upon them as well as you answer. So we have Jan Jet uh, Jensman who writes, uh, Nord Stream 2 has been tracked upon shortly by Trine. Will it actually be completed? Why have Denmark, Germany, Sweden not listened more carefully to Baltic states plus Poland, particularly after 2014? Is it purely economic gains? Question mark. And then also from Rob Sarkman again, is the EU sufficiently on the ball when it comes to energy as a priority of geopolitics and security? What could and should it should do more? The floor is yours. Thank minutes. you. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I'll just uh, first... Um... Will Nord Stream 2 be completed? That's a good question. As I said, the sanctions are now hanging over the heads of, of the port where the, the pipeline ships are anchored uh, and they will target um, the mayor of Sassnitz and all people cooperating, even canteens serving food for Nord Stream 2 personnel. Uh, everything will just be and i don't remember the exact work, wording but it was something like you know heaven and hell uh, will will be turned over if you assist in this uh, pipeline and this is by the u.s senate so i don't know will it happen maybe it's been a maybe for a very long time uh, then Mikkel, to your question about biden uh, will this change anything uh, Nord stream 2 is a bipartisan issue in the u.s so you know republican or democrat they don't want it. They might have a more you have more tact in in communicating this uh, to uh, 
to the parties involved, but, but I, I don't see the US position changing uh, at all. And you also asked Mikkel, uh, what will this mean for Eastern Europe? Obviously, if uh, Nord Stream 2 is completed, the Ukraine will be uh, in trouble because it's been a, a major transit country for, for Russian gas to Europe. And much of this gas, uh, it is, is obvious that this will be rerouted and go through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So Ukraine will be, will be hanging in the balance if, if the pipeline is completed. And that's also been openly you know, discussed for a very long time. Uh, I think even our prime minister and Den former prime minister, Anders Fogh Rasmussen said, if Denmark can just hold its ground until Ukraine uh, negotiates its new transit deals, that was the end of last year, then we've done a good thing. You know, we've really accomplished what we were set to do. And we did, we did hold our ground for that long uh, in a series of moves that were sometimes technical, sometimes, you know, completely incomprehensible, illegal. Uh, we did what we could, let's say, if, we, if you take, uh, look at the, at, the, at the Nord Stream pipeline uh, from, from the angle of, you know, avoiding it, we did what we could. Um, in Denmark. And then briefly um, to why didn't we listen to the countries to the east? Why didn't we listen to the Baltics, to Poland, to the countries who've been, uh, I think Thomas, you said we were shouting since 2008, right? Since Georgia, uh, stuff is happening. We were listening. We changed our, our continental shelf legislation to be able to include uh, foreign and security issues in our evaluation of these underwater pipelines. Before we could only do environmental and, and economical uh, evaluations. So we did stuff there. But I think what's important to say here for small countries like the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries, we depend on international law. And if we don't follow international law ourselves, it's very, very easy for someone else. I think Maria called it the big elephant in the region to say, then why should we then uh, follow international legislation? And there is a pretty distinct legislation uh, when it comes to underwater pipelines in, in, in a sea region. You know, there you have an economic exclusive zone, you have, a, a, you have a national territory on the seabed, and we've been trying to follow that kind of legislation, but still wriggling. Still, so then the Danish government has been wriggling within that, you know, that room of maneuver that we had. Um, so, so, so we did listen, and there was in in Sweden just briefly. Sweden, they only had an economic exclusive zone. There wasn't much they could do, but the island of Gotland, for instance, said, "No, we won't store the pipes for the Nord Stream two project, even if they were to make a, a huge profit from it." They said no, and that it was that decision could be made on the municipal level, which is interesting, also being. You know, from my point of view, at least a security issue, right? And then they have the harbor saying no. And then Karlsham in need of a lot of money. Well, they said yes. Uh, and then you were like, okay, so the pipeline went on. Um, we listened, we couldn't do anything else. Does the EU have its eye on the ball? We had an EU energy union established in 2015, actually, you know, pushed along by this uh, understanding growing understanding that energy is security. Um, so we have an energy union, they have uh, different um, projects of, of common interest that they, they uh, support that even financially sometimes and, and our region has benefited from that. Uh, I've mentioned some of the projects, uh, the Baltic pipe, which is a gas pipeline that goes from Norway to Poland is another one and it's coming, so. Thank you, thank you Trine. Okay, so we have four minutes left. Uh, so I want to go to concluding remarks, but before uh, before I do, I just wanna uh, make note of two questions uh, from the chat. We have a question about uh, options for Sweden and Finland with, with regards to aligning more uh, with NATO. And we have a question regarding what the UK can do in the, in the future to foster confidence uh, in the Baltic Sea area region. So you can address them as you please. But uh, other than that, I wanted to give each panelist one minute, but we have only one minute um, to, to, to say something about 
uh, where do you see the Baltic Sea region in five years? What do you see of prospects for, for Baltic Sea region security? So we'll, we'll, we'll start in the order that we gave the presentations. So we'll start with Anas, one minute. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much for an interesting discussion. I think that uh, where I see the Baltic Sea region in, the, in, in five years, is uh, not very different from where it is today, but I think the discussions today has shown that there will be some differences. I think it's not different in the sense that uh, we will still have uh, Russia and let's keep calling it the, uh, the, the big elephant in the, in the region uh, that we all uh, need to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to direct our attention towards. We will still as small states need to show uh, the stronger states why it's important to engage in this region, what the consequences will do will be also for them and for, for the wider European region uh, if they uh, do not. I think what might change and what our discussion today has changed is that what we see in recent years and continue to see now is the security outlooks of the Nordics and the Baltics coming more together than there were a few uh, years ago. And also that this is now materializing into uh, to stronger cooperation. And that's a good thing and a good point of, uh, of departure for the future. Excellent. Thank you, Anas. And also thank you very much for brief, uh, keeping it brief here at the end. Uh, Maria, you're up. Thanks very much. Well, on my part, I just hope that uh, we see less of uh, this kind of rhetoric and this kind of politics that very much follow the example of, of Donald Trump in the region, in the broader East European region, and that includes Estonia that uh, unfortunately, you know, has, has also taken, taken the Kaczynski and Orban regimes as, as its example. So I, this is obviously, uh, you know, highly detrimental also uh, when it comes to the security policy, something that Thomas touched upon. So, so I hope that, you know, with, with Trump leaving the office and, and some of this normalization of, of transatlantic relations uh, returning, uh, that will be also a certain um, normalization of, of the you know, political rhetoric and, and way of engagement uh, in, in the region. So that's that. Thank you. And then, uh, then we have Trine. Thank you, Miguel. Yeah, as I said before, the Biden administration is not going to mean a lot when it comes to gas, uh, I think it might uh, mean something in terms of, of more LNG coming, uh, the liquefied natural gas coming to our region from the US, uh, but we will still see um, spectacles and, and, and hard politics when it comes to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, in terms of, of the, the disruption I had in my in my title of my talk, I, I think that we might see a disruption in the electric, electricity systems and the, and the, the desynchronization of, of, of uh, the Baltic states from the Belarus and, and Russian uh, zone will mean something very important for those countries, but also for the region uh, in terms of, of trade, but also in terms of basically just being much more independent in the electricity domain which I mean is a, is a form of geopolitics. Um, yeah, but as Anna, uh, the changes won't come fast. This is very slow. This is like the big tectonic plates of a region that's, that are changing, but I think it's coming. Okay, thank you, Trine. And then uh, Thomas, one minute. Yes. Uh, well, in the, in the, on the defense side of business, we tend to view uh, everything in much longer timelines than, uh, than everywhere else, perhaps. Uh, and if the present trends and trajectories hold, uh, we will probably see the region which, uh, which has uh, stronger defense forces, stronger, more defense capability, better resourced uh, military. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we will also see the same kind of anxieties, the same kind of fears and concerns that we currently have uh, across the region. Uh, maybe a little bit more cooperation uh, and, and in practical terms, uh, not only in, in terms of talking about it, but at the same time, also some 
perhaps new uncertainties, uh, particularly related to, to, to China's rise, and within the region also uh, the, the trajectory of Putin's regime. We don't know. They may collapse, they may implode uh, with all the uh, uh, consequences to the region, uh, but also Belarus, the future of Belarus, and, and uh, uh, in, in the context of the present uh, uh, tumult that, that we see. So there will be new uncertainties and new, new, new issues to, 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 to be anxious about, uh, but you know, that's probably life of a small country, to be anxious all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. And then uh, last but not least, Håkon, where is Nordic cooperation in five years? I think Nordic cooperation in hard military defense in the next five years will be more integrated in terms of operational cooperation than it is today. Um, I think in all areas except uh, Article 5, collective defense, which is not possible to do because of NATO, Sweden and, and Finland's non-membership in NATO. But I think that apart from that, I think they will move closer together, all of them, including Denmark, um, uh, to coordinate and maybe even develop some sort of common planning uh, for how to deal with a crisis or a war in the Nordic region. Um, and so the potential adversary, the big adversary, in the, uh, elephant in the room, will know that there is at least a possibility that the Nordic states will stand together and be able to stand together in a crisis in the Nordic region. And of course, that will contribute to deterring such a crisis. And I think there are two reasons for this. One is Putin, and the other is um, not Trump anymore, but the increasing uncertainty about US security guarantees. I think things will be better with Biden, but the same sort of long-term trends that we've seen with the Obama administration will still be there. And so we have to take more responsibility for our own security. And one way of doing that, not the only, only one, but one way of doing that is to do more Nordic. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Thank you for the, the, the answers uh, and uh, for managing to, to almost uh, stay within the, the, uh, the scheduled time for this. It's been great uh, to hear so many uh, nuanced, uh, different perspectives about Baltic Sea region. Uh, security. Here at DEEZ we will continue to work on Baltic Sea region security uh, going forward. So we hope to, to see uh, uh, many of you uh, again uh, for the next seminars or briefs or reports that we will have coming out uh, on Baltic Sea region security in the coming years. And I hope to be able to cooperate with, with the, the, many of the people on the panel on this in the years to come. Thank you so much. <laughs>